What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Hangout edition of Learn Crypto. My name is Nick Hellman, and you might recognize that individual. That is Josiah Spackman, the Digibyte New Zealand ambassador. Um, if you haven't seen our other Hangout sessions in the past, we've had professional videos pertaining to just Digibyte, but these Hangout sessions are really just me and Josiah, uh, some crypto friends getting together. Of course, we're going to talk about Digibyte, maybe Bitcoin, maybe Rapids as well, some other projects, but really just see what's going on in the current crypto market. So what's going on, Josiah? There's a lot going on in the crypto markets, that's for sure, man. There is blood on the streets, and it's just, it's really funny. Literally, you can see day by day as people's, like, emotion kind of goes up, and then it goes down, and it's like a total roller coaster out there. It's a great time to be alive, don't get me yeah. wrong, but. <laughs> if, you're, if you believe in the space and you're looking to accumulate, you know, you've, you've been praying for these prices for a long time, uh, for people who are chasing at their all-time highs, they're kind of getting wrecked right now. So they got to reevaluate what their mindset is. If they're truly long-term on blockchain and the potentials of cryptocurrencies, this is a great time to practice dollar cost averaging and reducing yeah. your cost basis for your portfolio. And, you know, I think we're starting to see a lot of these projects folding because they're insolvent or developers yeah. are burnt out or it's just kind of a, an exit scheme ICO. And uh, you're kind of starting to see which projects I think will be here until the next bull run because they're sticking around, still building, still staying active. Yeah, man. It's actually, it's really funny. So I still remember one of the things that you and Todd said to me was you're like, you've got to take out a little bit here and things and don't keep all your eggs in that box. I didn't listen. <laughs> and obviously that hurts. But like you say, those who believe in the longer term vision and who are not just here for a quick buck, really, you know, they're, they're the people who are, are long term going to be the most I don't want to say rewarded because that's the wrong kind of, uh, I, I suppose, perspective for those same kind of people. But they're the ones who are definitely going to benefit the most being here long term and having been in since the beginning. They'll know a lot more for starters. Yeah. Not just about like the money side, about the highs and the lows, but also specifically about the technology. What goes into it? Why it's important for, you've seen this thing going around with, uh, is it Trace Mayer on the 3rd of January? Yep. Pull your keys, uh, uh, sorry, pull your crypto out of the exchanges and, and show sovereignty with your own keys. And I think like that's a really cool thing. And obviously the people who've been around for longer are going to know more about that, know why it's important, um, know what the, the value is of holding your own keys and, and that sort of thing as well. So yeah, I definitely agree with you there on that one. That's Yeah, definitely not your keys, not your money. So I mean, proof of keys exactly. is what they call it on January 3rd if you guys want to participate. Essentially, all that is is say you have a Ledger Nano S, you're going to take your cryptocurrency off the exchanges and move it over to that private uh, wallet where you have the private keys. And that's going to kind of legitimize and prove that these exchanges actually hold the cryptocurrencies they're having traded on their platform. Um, some people are worried what that might do. Maybe an exchange closes down because it's proved that they don't actually have the cryptos. I would say that the ones that are probably safe, say you don't have a Ledger right now, you don't feel like you're advanced enough to do that. I think Binance and Coinbase are probably the safest, most well-known. And even Coinbase has a little insurance backing uh, their cryptocurrencies there. So for those of you not as advanced, I would say at least move your cryptos to those larger exchanges before January 3rd. Yeah. And just certainly try and find out a little bit about it. So I had somebody who was messaging me and he said, what are my private keys? And that's actually a really good question because a lot of people kind of, they'll, they'll look at things like the SPV wallets or they'll look at things like Exodus and they'll go, what are my private keys? All I've got is my recovery phrase. So long as you've got that recovery phrase and the software that you're using is open source, even if it's not open source, you can still probably extract your currency from those private keys. So specifically, I'm, I'm thinking at the moment of the Digibyte wallet. There's also things like Coinomi. There's Exodus. There's the Garda wallets. There's a whole bunch of them. And as long as you've got that recovery phrase, basically you take the recovery phrase, add a little bit of math to it, and that's how you get your nice private key. So as long as you've got that, you are sovereign over your own funds. Yep. If you I'd, don't have that, however, you're up shit's creek, really. Yeah. I'd also <laughs> add in like the, the QT wallet that's used for a lot of these cryptocurrencies. That yeah. You can also just do the backup. So if you go to the top uh, left, it'll say file, wallet backup. That's going to give you your wallet.dat file. And that file, if you drag that over in a, a newly updated QT wallet, that's going to serve as your private key. Your coins will regenerate in that new wallet. And then now you're still sovereign yeah. over your cryptocurrencies. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And that's actually one of the things that um, Trace himself was kind of 
suggesting people try if they can. If you can, download the QT wallet, the core wallet for most of them, like uh, Bitcoin Core, Vertcoin Core, Digibyte Core. Fire it up. Participate in the network. Download the blockchain. Watch what happens. See how long it takes to sync. Um, and I think that's a really good idea. I think that's really cool. Well, and also, you know, I think the big thing that I kind of go over, so my roommate's sitting right over here, actually. This is his <laughs> first time. He just came to me. He, he opened uh, CoinMarketCap, looked at the prices. He's like, whoa, these prices are getting pretty low. And he's now interested after living upstairs in my house for like two years, finally interested in cryptocurrencies, and he's getting on board. And it nice. kind of reminded me of having to go back to the basics. And I think I need to produce more beginner content because I was sitting here, you know, how to sign up for Coinbase, how to sign up mm -hmm. for Binance, how to download Rapid's QT wallet, how to start staking, you know? So I think it's important. Uh, and there's a lot of things that kind of get overlooked nowadays because we've been in the industry for a while now and we're just kind of used, oh, you click here, you click here, you're good to go. I think yeah. we need to continue to explain that to keep expanding this ecosystem. Yeah, and so because obviously a lot of people jumped in last year in sort of November, December when there was a big rally and even sort of tapering off into January, February. But even those people don't specifically know all of these sort of little nuances and the differences and things. And so, like you mentioned before about an exchange, what might happen if everybody pulls all of their coins off of an exchange? I know there's a couple of exchanges that are out there that are running on fractional reserve. And so if they were to do that, that's not going to end well for anybody who happens to have all of their stuff on that exchange. They're basically, they're banking on you keeping all of your cryptocurrency in there and they can just milk it out of there as they're going along to do whatever they want with, spend it on hookers and blow. I don't know. But, and really one of the value propositions for this crypto is a lot of them do have a finite supply and a, an explainable inflation rate, meaning that fractional reserve really isn't meant that kind of defeats the purpose of cryptocurrencies and the exchanges <laughs> really shouldn't be doing that. So Exactly. But, but you're right. And so there are people who are now still coming along. And these are, these are the times that everybody back in November, December was going, you're never going to see, you know, Bitcoin reach $6,000 again. Look at it. It's going all the way up. It's gone now. You're going to wish you bought in. And there are people who are now coming along and looking at it going, well, yeah, BTC now at $3,000 is, you know, it's looking interesting. It sounds interesting. I can see the value proposition. I like the idea of being sovereign over my own finances and things like that. So it's not just the people, like you say, that came in last year, but also these new people that we've still got to keep educating and explaining things and, and writing these guides and doing these videos and, and building the software as we have been all along, but even more with a, I suppose, a laser sort of focus on why we're doing it. We're doing it for these next, you know, let's, let's say hypothetically there's what, maybe let's say there's 700,000 people worldwide who are into crypto, just ballpark number. That's like a tiny fraction. We've got to try and build for the next 99% who are still coming, who are going to be jumping in and are going to go, what is a private key? Because I've got my mobile wallet, but is this a private key? And so that, that, that kind of thing is what keeps me going, I suppose, even in these <laughs> dark times price-wise. <laughs> that people seem to be so worried about, right? Yeah, every, every user matters and uh, getting users on board will help you in the end and, you know, help the platforms and, and cryptocurrencies you like to use in everyday basis. And really that's what's going to be needed for mass adoption. So talking about mass adoption, what's been going on with Digibyte? We haven't talked here in a while. Um, a lot of people know that Digibyte is UTXO. Everybody sees them as like a peer-to-peer -peer transactional currency, almost like a competitor against Bitcoin. But I do know that Digibyte is starting to create two new value propositions for itself. One of them being kind of a protocol platform like Ethereum with Digi assets. And the other one kind of targeting security, uh, utilizing Digi ID. So maybe if you can kind of get into both what, what's going on with Digibyte lately, uh, kind of explain these other two value propositions for Digibyte. And maybe even touch base on what's been going on in Venezuela as well. Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm representing a nice shirt here from uh, Crypto Bantam. Um, that I bought from them for basically to, to go towards supporting Venezuela. So they've donated all of, a whole lot of money from that as well. Uh, we've been doing a whole bunch of things. And I, it's actually, it's interesting that you kind of, you mentioned at right after mass adoption, because we had somebody who, who posted out a tweet and was like, look at the great stuff that Digibyte's been doing lately, pushing for mass adoption in Venezuela. And I kind of, I, I stopped for a moment and I sent them a, like a nice polite reply. And I was like, look, it's great that we want everybody talks about mass adoption and it's this 
mantra that's just been chanted over and over and over again, like to the beating of drums, basically. But that's not actually what we're doing here. We're not, we're not doing this aid work in Venezuela to help push mass adoption. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Basically, there are people out there who need help. We're in a position to help them. We're possibly in the best position to help them. So let's help them. And so we have some amazing volunteers that are there that are on the ground who are like helping their neighborhood. They're literally taking meals out and delivering them. We're working in a hospital. We're doing things like repairing their air conditioning and their refrigerator that they use to keep uh, medicines in and things like that. So if mass adoption comes as a result of this, then that is freaking awesome. But that's not the goal here. The goal here is actually just to be helpful and to help people. I think that's a really cool goal as well. I think sometimes it's nice to step away from that mass adoption motto, you know, and just, yeah, just do the right thing really. So, so what's going but, on with, what's going on with digi assets? And I'm yeah, so, kind of going under the radar because of the market conditions. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think I don't even know a ton about it. I've just been kind of seeing it floating around Twitter and you said we were going to get on here today. So I got to ask you what's going on with that. So I've actually just finished a, a video with a guy, Amon Unlimited. He did some really awesome videos. Um, I've been working with him. And one of them is a video for uh, Digi Assets. Now, this is something that we've been working on for a while now. Relatively kind of, like you say, it's flown under the radar. Look, we could come out tomorrow and we could announce, like, what are we up to? An Ethereum 9.0 killer or something like that, right? And everybody would just kind of go, oh, yeah, whatever, right? Like, it's not... <laughs> You can come up with the greatest thing ever and, and no one's going to give a shit. But one of the things, we're still working on it regardless. And, and we're still uh, like ironing out the kinks and, and, and working on the protocol. And there was even a, a really cool photo that was um, put up on Twitter a couple of weeks ago of Jared Tate. And he's actually, he's up there and he's writing on a whiteboard back and forth, like bite by bite, analyzing the protocol and things like that. So yeah, we can. We're going to be doing some cool stuff around um, everything from token issuance through to, hey, look, I've gone out of focus. How cool is this? <laughs> it'll come right. Yay, Logitech. Thanks, Logitech. I swear it'll come right. Anyway, um, so we're going to do everything from, we'll be doing token issuance. You can do like ICOs. You can do coins. You can do um, platforms. You can do trading cards. You can do... That was actually one of the things we were looking at was ticket issuance for things like if you are at a, let's say you're at a, maybe, maybe a basketball game. You can issue a token for a basketball game that is lodged on the blockchain. That is then, there's no overselling of tickets because you can see the finite supply. There is no, I suppose, what are some of the other things like scalping and things like that? You can see that it's gone to one person and not been on sold. Yeah. So there's a bunch of really cool stuff like that, that we're going to be able to do with digi assets. That's going to, uh, it's, there are so many different things that we can do with it. But I suppose the main thing that really excites me is we're not limited to Ethereum's, what is it? 17 transactions per second. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to quickly see if I can. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want to work <laughs> no there it goes there we go hey sorry and i'm back <laughs> so your your transactions per second in your network capacity for the current digi by blockchain is, is superior to that of ethereum far that superior so we're currently we're currently rocking 560 transactions per second and thanks to digi speed that's basically going to double every uh two years by doubling the block size effectively so at the moment, two megabyte blocks, and that's going to double in 2019 to four megabyte blocks. Now, the last time we actually filled a block up, a long time ago. It never actually happens because the blocks are being churned out every 15 seconds. Uh, I think it's actually slightly closer to 14.9 seconds, just to, <laughs> but it's pretty damn close, right? So, yeah, because of, because of the larger blocks that we are slowly ramping up to, and the, the fact that we have 15 second blocks, yeah, we're going to be able to handle a lot more, a lot more transactions. So the next time CryptoKitties comes out, you're not going to have to worry about your, your other token over here that falls over and goes, look, I can't, I can't use this. Like you've got some application that relies on the transactions happening every, let's say 30 seconds, but CryptoKitties has gone and filled all your blocks. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So 
I'm really looking forward to that. And we're making some really good strides with that as well. Um, we've actually been uh, starting now to work on integration inside of the mobile wallet. So that's not something we've really talked out about a lot, but you're not only going to be able to buy, send, receive all through your mobile wallet, but you'll also be able to issue and burn any kind of digi asset through your cell phone as well. That's so yeah, I'm so excited for that. Man. I'm really excited. We're going to have more videos and things coming. I'll flick you through a couple of videos as well. The one that I've been working on with Amon Unlimited that kind of gives you a little introduction to digi assets and, and it's, cool. yeah, it's great, man. I'm super pumped. And then I guess the, the last value proposition really to talk about Digibyte before we just go on to the next topic is, you know, Digi ID. I know this has been around for a little bit, yeah. but how is that going? Is Digi ID getting integrated into more websites? Uh, and can you explain what Digi ID is for somebody who has never heard of it before and why the Digibyte blockchain is needed for it to work? Yeah, so Digi ID is a fast and secure way to log into websites, uh, applications, building security, even for example. Uh, so I actually I, I hooked up a little. Uh, Raspberry Pi for a little while and had it opening and closing the front door and, and just by you, you scan a QR code and if it authenticates you using the same uh, public private key encryption as your Bitcoin wallet Digibyte wallet for example that same technology is basically used to authenticate you for other things like a website so we're actually we're going through the process now even of uh, getting additional support from more wallet vendors. So if you happen to use CoinOmi, for example, we've been having a bit of a chat with them about uh, integrating DigiID. So if you, you can use your CoinOmi wallet to hold it up on a website, scan the QR code and log in that way. So yeah, there, there is a whole lot of really cool stuff that's happening in that space as well right now. And CoinOmi is not the only one that we've been, been looking at. Uh, there are a few websites that are now cropping up specifically. We're also looking at some larger, there's a, a, a group called Antum and they're looking to use it as a higher level kind of government authentication for people uh, in another country so that you can use DigiID to authenticate and validate yourself uh, when it comes to dealing with the government. So there's some really cool stuff there that we're, and essentially, guys, like when you go to Facebook, like say it ever was integrated in Facebook, that's probably a ways away, but you, instead of a username and a password to get on, you would actually use your DigiID, which theoretically can't get stolen. As you know, there's been hacks on Facebook, Google, et cetera. Now your email address with your corresponding password is available. Somebody can not only get on your Facebook, but if you use the same password for other websites, which many people do, then they can yeah. access other websites as well. DigiID really eliminates that. Also, I think it takes the security of the 2FA. A lot of you use two-factor authentication with the Google Authenticator app. That's awesome. You need to do that for all your exchanges. But uh, ideally, if you had DigiID or another similar technology come out, it would really replace the 2FA in a more secure and immutable way and, uh, and also easier because then you don't have to type in your username, password, then slide the piece and then do the 2FA. It's going to be yep. all essentially in one click and one scan. So. Yeah, so the cool thing is, is if you're on your mobile, you basically just put your thumb up against the QR code and it will fire it up inside of the Digibyte application and you can authenticate that way. Now, yeah, you're right. This is also really cool because it, it works both as a username, as a password and as your 2FA. So even Google have come out and they've basically said, don't use our authenticator. Nobody internally basically uses it anymore. Timed one base, uh, what is it, um, TOTP? timed one time passwords are no longer considered secure. And in fact, we've even seen people uh, like the founder of Digibyte, Jared Tate. He was the victim of a SIM swapping incident where somebody found his cell phone number and they went out and they ported the number across to a different carrier and reissued the SIM. And so they were able to then log into uh, a couple of the services, say for example, like Telegram. You can't log into someone's Telegram with DigiID with their cell phone number if you are scanning a QR code that's only on your phone, right? Like, so you've, you've got to be in control of it and there's no third party like a seemingly helpful mobile carrier yeah. going, yeah, sure. Mr. Person who's not actually who you say you are, have the phone number. Here you go. And, and causing a huge security vulnerability. Like I think that, that guy's taking AT&T or whatever um, to, to court in the States over um, they, they allowed a SIM swap and basically this, uh, this person had their exchange uh, account hacked because they had a whole lot of funds in there that relied on sending them an SMS message 
So this malicious person, once he's got their phone number, can then receive that SMS message because the dude had reused his passwords elsewhere. And so all of the security was for nothing. So DigiID is going to be amazing. And in one really nice foul swoop, it's going to go and get rid of all of those problems. So it's, it's, it's amazing, man. It's really awesome. cool. Well, you guys need to work with the exchanges then because now you're, now you're scared yeah. about the password and 2FA, et cetera. You know, so now, now you got to do something about it and get the DigiID on Binance, Coinbase, et cetera. <laughs> We've been talking with a couple of exchanges and some of them are actually really quite receptive to the idea because once, once you explain it to the more technical people who are, who are looking after the service and managing all those private keys, they're like, actually, this is really cool. This is exactly what we need to help people secure their funds. And so especially as we're now moving into third-party wallet support, it's not just a uh, let's play favorites with Digibyte kind of aspect, but let's actually just take, you can sign in with any other sort of third-party wallet that it is supported on. So yeah, I'm, we're, we're definitely making some cool strides in that aspect. And it's, it's going to be really exciting to kind of see that pop up on exchanges uh, in the future. That's cool. I'm glad we caught up on Digibyte. Digibyte, as you guys know, is... One of those that I always say, people are like, well, what do you do with your portfolio allocation? I'm not giving you guys financial advice, but usually we go through the whole spiel of portfolio allocation. Like, well, you, you forgot Digibyte. And I always say, well, whenever I have, you know, a little bit of Bitcoin left over or some spare change or spare, spare money in the wallet, that's usually when I pick up some Digibyte. You guys all know that DGB is something less than a penny right now. So for a dollar, you can get over a hundred. You can really slowly start to accumulate yourself a nice little bag and we'll see what you guys and Digibyte can do with uh, as far as it being a peer-to-peer -peer transactional currency, if you can provide any value in the security ecosystem. And then lastly, if you can start competing with the likes of Ethereum or EOS or Ethereum Classic in the protocol sector as well. So that will be interesting to see what happens. So, and like you mentioned earlier as well about dollar cost averaging and things. And <laughs> it's, yeah, that's a great time to be dollar cost averaging. I suppose if you're, if you're like me and you, you, uh, uh, put some more in, I suppose, uh, towards the end of last year, and <laughs> and didn't listen to didn't listen to Todd and Nick, and you know, diversify, to and get cash, get some Bitcoin, you know. But hey, hey, we told Let you that be a listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Something everybody should learn, and you you know, you learn from their mistakes in trading. And uh, like we said, if you're long term and you're still hodling that same bag, didn't really uh, sell down here and miss the rally, then you're still doing okay for the future. In in, in my perspective. We have much higher objectives for utilization, value appreciation of these assets, many of these assets and platforms moving forward. So, we'll so speaking, speaking of not listening to, to Todd and Nick, you've been really on the, the Rapids chain lately, haven't you? I have been talking about Rapids a little bit lately. So Rapids, you know, RPD Rapids, at Rapids RPD on Twitter, um, they kind of brought me on as an advisory role. So I kind of actually been participating and helping them do their thing. And they're really created uh, during the bear market to create a project with transparency and uh, trying to create utilization even during the bear market. No ICO. Um, as you saw, a lot of these companies became insolvent or they took your ICO money and left. And also yeah. kind of, you know, Rapids isn't trying to compete with the UTXOs, the Digibyte, the Bitcoin, Litecoin, Burcoin, you know, the truly decentralized uh, cryptocurrencies. Instead, it's trying to compete more with the market sector of like Redcoin or RDD. Um, really, Rapids was kind of created um, after a couple of events. First of all, RDD it finds itself in the top 100, top 50 market cap with not that much transparency, not that much really active dev work, social media work, and it's supposed to be this social media cryptocurrency. Um, and also, I was an advisor with Tour to Crypto. Digibyte was actually a yeah. sponsor. This was a cherry event where uh, two individuals biked from New York all the way to California, ending in World CryptoCon, and any cryptocurrencies raised were donated to Hawk, which is a non-for-profit. Uh, they said they would take on cryptocurrencies. We got them downloaded, their private keys, on their personal desktop wallet to kind of teach them about cryptocurrencies and what nice. you can do with them. And, uh, you know, Redcoin was a sponsor as well, and they raised something like, you're not even going to believe it, they raised like $1.47. So, you know, individuals within Rapids, they, they, were, they were either working with Redcoin or, or understood what they were going after for the market sector. And they said, enough with this. So really this team is a conglomerate of a bunch of individuals that have been a part of a lot of smaller cryptocurrencies that they felt did some things wrong. And they're just trying to be transparent, not have an ICO and, uh, and make something work and create utilization of this network. So, I mean, it's they got- pretty the rare these days, isn't it? Like the whole- not an ICO and wanting to be transparent because you see so many things like 
we were, we were talking about a, a digifact. We've been doing a countdown with our digifacts and trying to explain to people what it means that Digibyte launched with a, like a countdown on Bitcoin talk back five years ago now. People are like, what's the big deal? Well, there was actually, there was a lot of scams out there. There was a lot of non-transparent uh, blockchains that were cropping up. There were a lot of, and, and we've seen even in 20, uh, 2017, 2018, the ICOs and things. And so to actually have a, a, a fairly launched blockchain, or like you say with Rapids, if they're coming out of the woodworks to go, you know what, we need more transparency. I think that's really cool. I think that's awesome. Yeah, and that's really uh, what they've been doing. The mainnet actually just launched today. So Crux24 and ByPTC supported the token swap. It was an ERC20 token. Uh, they quickly realized, wow, scalability is a problem. So they created their own proprietary blockchain built off of the Quark, algor Quark algorithm uh, right. from Pivx. And uh, they, got, they got swapped, you know. So they see transaction fees go from, you know, $1.47. So like a 10,000 RPD down to now transaction fees are 0 0.0001 RPD. That kind of shows the power there of getting on your own blockchain versus being on the congested and expensive Ethereum blockchain. So yep. uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I think it's interesting. They've already, um, they've only been around two months and they've already got their main net done. They've got on a few exchanges. They're, they're uh, relaunching their website. They're going to be masternodes and staking go live today as well. So they are going to be a proof of stake cryptocurrency, two tier proof of stake with uh, staking and masternodes. And uh, nice. the tip bots are almost completed for Twitter, Telegram, Discord, and uh, just trying to jumpstart utilization of the network and show how easy it is for individuals that know nothing about cryptocurrencies to just participate in the ecosystem by tipping each other or doing a service for yeah. Rapids, et cetera. And I think that's really kind of what they're targeting. I think that was one of the things that got people originally very interested in Dogecoin was you're on some forums or you're on Reddit or you're on Telegram wasn't really around so much back then, but people would send you a message and you'll reply and, and they'll go, that's a cool message. Have some Dogecoin. Mm -hmm. And I think there is definitely a lot of, there, there's a, certainly a good space for that kind of general sort of tipping for remittance and things, you know, actually that's, that's probably a really good question. So I, I got a feeling I know how you're going to answer this, but what are your thoughts on people who say that Bitcoin is like basically for Bitcoin maximalists who would say that you only need Bitcoin, everything else is a shit coin and lightning's going to solve all of our problems for all of these other things in terms of me tipping you and you tipping me. Personally, look, I think Bitcoin number one has the network effect that it is going to serve as a digital store of value and be gold 2.0. Number one. Number two, do I think that it, oh, it's, you know, am I Roger Beer saying it's failed for transactions? No, I don't think that at all. But I think Bitcoin, the purpose under current construction um, should be used for larger sums, larger sums of money, you know, large scales, transfer, transfers of wealth or large international transactions, maybe uh, a trade from Japan to the United States for a large amount of, of freight. And then you can do one Bitcoin transaction. But like you said, I just don't think it's functionally sound with the 10-minute block timers to do tipping like Rapids is trying to do, to, to do um, a lot of stuff that Digibyte has done with the amount of, uh, with DigiID, with the Digi assets, where you're going to have all these transactions occurring on the network at a rapid rate. You know, Bitcoin has proved that under those circumstances, it gets bogged down. I think Lightning Network is interesting. I think Lightning Network is growing and it's going to increase that use case. Uh, but I think Bitcoin is fine with its current network effect if it's a store of value, gold 2.0. And even if it's only for larger sums of money, I think that there's going to be some other solid players, maybe Digibyte, maybe Rapids, maybe Vertcoin, that uh, have, have faster transactions and can be used for more day-to-day -day, uh, purchases. Personally, I think some people might be mad at that, but uh, I think there's going to be more survivors than just Bitcoin. I wholeheartedly agree. It's not like we're in this, this one little, like, crypto pie right and it's like this is all bitcoin I, I like you can divvy that up a million different ways but it's interesting you bring up vertcoin you've been reading about their 51 percent hits and things I like that been, i have been reading a little bit about that yeah kanan actually from uh, vertcoin provided me some of their medium posts and stuff like that nice. it's funny i i mean it's not it's not funny like because that sucks to happen to any blockchain i still remember you and i i think we were talking about it with a couple months ago when it just happened to Bitcoin gold 
um, I was I was doing some. Re this was a few weeks back now, and I was just looking at some different things, going to get some uh, screenshots of different comparisons for different coins and things like that. And I happened to bring up Vertcoin, and I had a look, and all of, I, I, and basically what I was seeing didn't look right. Missed one of their divs, and I'm like, yo, dude, I think you've just had a big double spin. I'm seeing a, a large reorg here of like this much. He's like, nah, 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 that can't be right. And we record up 12 hours later, he's like, yeah, fuck. <laughs> yeah, so the last thing I read said they, they're no exchange, uh, they weren't sure if anybody, um, you know, lost their coins because of that or if an exchange lost their funds. That's the last I've heard of it. Um, yeah, apparently it was 100 grand worth. Yeah, and I know that they've been working on creating their own proprietary or whatever you want to call it, uh, hashing algorithm to yep. uh, kind of fork off of what they're on right now to where they'll become and remain ASIC resistant. And really, the problem is all these renting sites. So if you want to attack, I'm not going to tell you guys how to do this, but you guys know how to do it. If you want to attack a cryptocurrency and you have enough money and there's enough hashing power available on a, on a rental site, you can rent yep. all that hash rewrite the blockchain once yours gets longer based on the uh, Satoshi's rule, then yours is now the real blockchain. And now you can commit some double spends before the development team can then fix uh, or reorganize that blockchain back to it, the original. Well, I suppose it's tough as well, because if you're going to be a GPU centered blockchain, right? Like, so it doesn't really matter if you are ASIC resistant or or not if you're so there's, there's there's two problems that i see here if you're if you're a gpu focused algorithm that's fine but there's always going to be like you say rental websites that allow you to rent the hash power and they work based on whoever's going to offer the most is going to be able to basically rent that hash power and so when we're talking, I think it, it only costs like maybe like a thousand bucks. Some of these blockchains, like I've seen them, um, are cost. I'll tell you what, let me quickly bring it up so I have like some some proper numbers here. Yeah, and especially some during of, the bear market, a lot of miners are shutting off their miners because the profitability isn't there. You know, and and for you guys, if you guys really need the U.S. dollars, I understand the profitability is not there in U.S. dollars. Uh, but if you're close to break even and you believe in the space, then you can still accumulate the coins at these levels. And with the lower amount of hash power on these networks, difficulty is lower. So you're earning more of these cryptocurrencies on a daily basis as well. And yep. really position yourself for the future. So rather than FOMOing, if you want to call it that, for, oh, I need to get my miners back on. Now the difficulty spikes by 100%. And it's like, dang, I should have just been mining that entire time. Yep. Well, it's interesting. So I'm looking here, right? And so this website that I've got tells you the cost to rent the hash power for an hour to do a double spin. So we're looking at, at some of these blockchains like Bulwark, $4, Paccoin, $3, uh, Quantum Resistant Ledger, $6, Zcoin, $3, Bitcoin Private, $46, bucks. even LBRY credits, $120. Bucks. Like, they're, yeah, so, so to do these double spins is not exactly expensive. So you can see why people do it because you almost double your money out of it. You attack an exchange and so this is, this is a big problem for exchanges. It's not about the walking into a store, you buy a pair of jeans, you walk out of the store, and then you double spin. That's not what's gonna happen, but people will attack exchanges. They'll deposit 100 grand, they'll deposit 200 grand. They will then redo the blockchain basically from their previous point, mine it faster than the main chain, so they then overtake, like you say, according to Satoshi's rule, and then release it to the world. And so the world goes, this has seven million, you know, and two blocks. This has seven million and five blocks. This is now the the actual chain. We're gonna move over here and goodbye to the hundred grand that you deposited because they've now converted that into probably Bitcoin. Because these are usually just an attack vector. People don't care specifically about Bitcoin gold. Yeah. They're not they're not Bitcoin gold miners going, oh, let's let's exit now and, and we'll double spend on our way out. Although they could, it's, it's more just, you know, somebody malicious, presumably. And, and they're, they're selling their currency for Bitcoin and then withdrawing the Bitcoin and then they're really sitting away you go. But the second part, so basically if your GPU, if your GPU favorite algorithm, that's great, but there's always going to be rentable hash power because there are so many graphics cards out there and anybody can just download the software, download it, hit the button and it will automatically profit switch based on whatever people are 
mining or offering you the most to mine sort of thing, right? So if, if someone comes along and instead of you currently making your five bucks a day, you get offered six bucks a day, you're gonna be like, yes, yeah, six bucks a day, right? But, but that's bad because it means that anybody can just uh, rent your stuff and, and attack a chain that is GPU only. Yeah, and the second part is when you're a minority hash power, which some of these other chains are, when you're not like the dominant hash power globally, it means that there is the hash power to be rented, even on ASICs. So that's kind of, this is my plug where I go, Digibyte solves that because we've got both ASICs and we've got the dominant hash power in these other ones, but we're also working to be GPU and FGPA friendly. And yeah. So there you go, guys. Mind is what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. And not only does the attack hurt the underlying cryptocurrency, because then they gotta, you know, they gotta panic, they gotta try to figure it out, and then they gotta try to kind of salvage the reputation. But it really hurts the end users of the exchanges as well, because yep. the exchanges then to combat this guys, they increase those confirmations. So when you send your Digibyte over to wherever Bitrex and it says six confirmations, say Digibyte got attacked, now Bitrex is probably gonna be like, well. To prevent that from happening again, we're upping it to 50 confirmations or 100 confirmations. So the end user then kind of suffers a little bit because if you want to deposit, you have to wait longer to trade that, to have possession of it. Or if you want to withdraw it, it takes it longer as well. Yeah, uh, so I think Vertcoin were on 400 confirmations or something like that. And it basically, 400 is 400, right? It basically worked out to be two days. And I was like, two days to deposit your money into an exchange. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. And that's what happens. And I mean, until they prove that it's secure again or until they can work out a deal to get that exchange to then reduce the confirmations, the end users of that exchange and for Vercoin or whatever it may be are going to suffer a little bit. So that's kind of a shame to see as well. And that's kind of another uh, factor after these double spends happen. Yeah, the Vercoin guys have also, so they're now, well, they, were, they were doing it originally anyway. They were changing from Lyra to RE version 2 to version 3, which was going to change things a little bit. So that the ASICs that are out there for Lyra 2 RE version 2 won't work. The goal is still long term for them to move to their own hashing algorithm, vert hash, which is supposed to be ASIC resistant. Um, but again, that's a wee way off, similar to how we're working on our autocrypt as well. Again, supposed to be ASIC resistant and favor GPU and if GPA miners. Um, but it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Well, thankfully, I guess for, for Vercoin, um, I suppose the price hasn't tanked as a result. We saw what happened with a couple of other things earlier on in the year. Um, and it really affected their price. And they're all going. The price on all these is already so low. There's not much more dumping to go. <laughs> <laughs> so what, going, going off that, what do you think about the current uh, cryptocurrency situation? You know, we were holding, you know, 6K on several attempts, 10, 12, 24 attempts, all the way back to February. Um, yeah. And then we were even really consolidating there at 6K. Todd and I uh, were a little more bullish that we were going to be able to hold around 5,800 to 6K and then eventually mm. find a bottom and move higher. Um, I personally think there's a couple catalysts that pushed, it, pushed us down here to the you know 3,500 level. But what do you think really caused this last drop? Or do you think that this was going to happen regardless? Like Craig Wright sort of thing or? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think we were holding that 6K and, you know, you're still seeing a little FUD in the market, but really the institutions are coming into play early next year. I think that's going to be a bull catalyst and a use case catalyst for the, the increase or the bullish movement of this cryptocurrency ecosystem. But I think yep. the, most bear, the most recent bear catalyst was uh, the Bitcoin Cash hard fork. Um, I told people to sell Bitcoin Cash before the snapshot. Yep. Yeah. That would have been a great play because now Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV have dumped from that uh, snapshot price. All right. And, and that's I thought it was just going to be both of those dumping. I was like, both of these are going to they're they're it's a contentious community that is splitting in half, and they're going to be competing with each other. So you already yep. have this community and this coin that many people in the ecosystem don't like, and now you're going to split it in half. I thought they were going to kill each other, which is kind of what happened. But I didn't see it bringing down the whole market. Craig Wright, I screenshotted it and tweeted it pretty much yeah. that he was openly selling his Bitcoin on the market, market selling, and then using that to continue to mine Bitcoin SV and support the Bitcoin SV uh, price. Yeah. I mean, he's probably manipulating it, buying it all up, creating volume, et cetera. Uh, he did, did delete that. But obviously, if you're selling, you know, Craig Wright probably had a lot of Bitcoin. And if he's openly selling it on the market, 
That's yeah. going to dump the price. Then you're going to have the retail investors like us freaking out a little bit, probably sell. And Roger Veer, since he was com competing to get that uh, BCH ticker symbol, he was probably selling his Bitcoin as well. So I think that's really yeah. what the most recent bear catalyst was and what caused this most recent dump. Between the two of them, basically just, just having a, an infight, really, like I'm the true vision. No, I'm the true vision. No, I'm the true vision. It's like, have you seen that? It's, it's one of those Looney Tune things where there's Daffy Duck and, and he's basically like, he'll rip it off. And then on the other side, Bugs Bunny will rip the poster off and go, no. And then he'll rip the poster off and go, no. It's just like that. I'm the true vision. No, I'm, and nobody won out of it, really. Yeah. They've both kind of, I suppose, gone their own way. And they've both got their own independent kind of aspects. But when they're both kind of now, like, they were together and... and who would have thought that a contentious hard fork community would result in a contentious hard fork again? <laughs> I think Craig Wright is still kind of remaining stubborn and still thinks Bitcoin SB is going to take over. Um, I think uh, Roger Veer obviously is still doing everything he can for Bitcoin Cash, but I think he's changed his tune a little bit, kind of saying that he's yeah. bullish on Bitcoin, bullish on the whole crypto ecosystem, not just Bitcoin Cash. And I think he kind of had... A, you know, a realization. Whether you like Roger Veer or not, back in the day, Roger Veer was one of the first evangelists for Bitcoin and for cryptocurrencies. He and got I, that name Bitcoin Jesus for a reason. Exactly. Right? I think he realized that he got caught up in this narcissistic or whatever it may be, he got caught up in this whole thing. And this fork made him realize, man, you know, all of the work I've done for the past decade, he, almost, he started wiping it out, ruining his reputation, hurting the price by selling Bitcoin because of an infighting with Craig Wright and in the Bitcoin cash a hard fork there. So I think he kind of changed his tune a little bit. He's like, man, I, I just would have wasted 10 years if I stay on this road. And I think he's back to like, all right, instead of arguing this or that, or this is the real Bitcoin or whatever, maybe we just need to focus on the utilization and get back to focusing on what blockchain can do for every individuals in their everyday life. So that's why I think yeah, he, like so far he's seeming like he's coming around a little bit. I kind of like because I can I can understand and I like some of the stuff that they're talking about in say Satoshi's vision. But at the same time, what I really don't like is the whole "we are the true Bitcoin" mantra. I don't I don't it doesn't resonate with me in the slightest. But what what like I kind of I, I see what you're what you're meaning there as well with Roger because I kind of feel like he's kind of gone. You know what? Maybe it doesn't just have to be. Bitcoin, or maybe it doesn't just have to be Bitcoin Cash. And I kind of feel like he's sort of adopted the same sort of a, a mindset or an outlook that the two of us both share that there is a lot of space in this crypto pie for more than just one cryptocurrency. It doesn't have to be one ring to rule them all, one ring to bind them in. And yeah, you know, like it's, <laughs> we can do this all and we can, there's, there's plenty basically to go around. Now, I'm not going to sit around and basically sing Kumbaya like they did on that stage. They, they had a really cool, it was a crypto convention recently. There was like six or seven different blockchains, everything from, um, who, was, who was on there? There was like Zcash people. There was Jared Tate for Digibuy. There was Richard Hart. And they all basically sat around and were like, yeah, we're buddy buds. This is great. Everything is awesome. No, everything is not awesome. It's not in the slightest. There are so many scams out there and people getting wrecked because of them. Like BitConnect was only allowed to flourish because people didn't call it out. Yeah. And look at the number two on the market cap right now. Yeah. XRP. This is a centralized shit coin. <laughs> but the, I can, I, there is certainly enough space in this for Roger Ver to come out and basically go, you know what? Bitcoin as more of a reserve currency, like an underlying, everything gets compared against it in Satoshi's. Totally cool. There is then more than enough space for, say, Monero to be the privacy-centric coin. There's more than enough uh, pie to go around for Rapids to be your general kind of like tipping currency for remuneration on social websites, uh, things like YouTube or Reddit or in chat and things like that, right? There's more than enough pie to go around for Digibyte to be your security and, and basically like focus, I suppose, assets, blockchain. It doesn't have to be one to rule them all. And in fact, you're never going to be able to get there because of the limitations, I suppose, in hard drive and bandwidth. Trying to run the entire 8 billion people or, or however many, 7.5 billion people off of one single blockchain, it's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to have some issues. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, think you just, I think you nailed it there with uh, what you were saying. You know, 
all these in the cryptocurrencies that I think can, that can create kind of like a business network or an agreement to try to help each other out are the ones that are all going to be able to get their piece of the pie. And really, because really what you need is you need network utilization. If people aren't using the network, you could have the best technology, the best yeah. crypto product. It doesn't, but if people aren't using it, it drives no value. Yet yeah. well, network utilization drives price appreciation and the value of that underlying network. And then the yeah. value of the underlying native token or native coin. That's just the fact of the matter. So really that's what it's all about. But in saying that, I don't think that we need a Dinta coin or a pot coin or a TH, you know, like I don't think we need a coin for everything. Let's, let's kind of find like a nice middle ground. So we've got the just Bitcoin for everything and we've got a cryptocurrency for, I would like to be kind of more in somewhere in the middle, you know? Like, yeah. Realistically, I mean, I hope there's no Denta coin supporters watching this. <laughs> Dentists aren't going to use Denta coin. Why does this thing keep pumping and dumping? Why is this thing worth so much money? If you own it, oh, next month, will you sell it, please? Like, okay, the, the, the riding it for the trades is awesome, but the joke's over. Nobody's yeah. going to use Denta coin. It's not a real thing. Dentists aren't going to use it. If anything, Maybe they can use a cryptocurrency that has the network effect of Bitcoin or they can accept it, but uh, you don't need to tokenize everything. I think, I think a lot of things are going to get tokenized, maybe tokenized securities like Apple stock. Obviously, if you can tokenize currency, you're seeing the stable coins really take off. Maybe you can digitize US dollar even, but I, I don't see it as we don't, we don't really need a Target coin, a Walmart coin. Uh, and that's the reward points. They already have that. They don't need blockchain technology for that. That's really just going to slow down their current reward structure. Instead, we should focus on getting them to yeah. accept to accept some of these UTXOs or accept others or integrate a tipping service, Redcoin, Rapids, or something into their platforms as well. So maybe maybe there would be a case for it if, if you had, like, let's say, rather than having a Dinta coin, for example, which is only used by Dinta. I mean, that's kind of cool because there are a bunch of different dentists themselves but dinta coin has proven time and time again it is just there for a pump and dump and there's nothing to it if you made money along the way that's great people made money along the way as well with bitconnect yeah and now it is worth nothing yeah. but there like there could be a rather than just let's let's just say rather than having like a starbucks coin there is i could see there being a really good value proposition in there being effectively like a coffee card coin that you could then use to effectively do uh buy buy coffee not just at starbucks but also at a bunch of other smaller ones or what about countries where starbucks isn't popular but they've got another major retailer and they can all basically agree right we're going to use this one coffee coin that is potentially running on digibuy but go. they <laughs> could yeah <laughs> It might be. I'll tell you a story about something. Well, now, in a now you know I got to go take up all the rights and all the dot coms for coffee coin. I'm Coffeecoin.com. Register it now. You hear it here first. <laughs> but the thing is, is, is you're right. Like why would, why would Walmart need to basically run that on the blockchain when they can basically just use a database? So I did this, this really interesting kind of exercise with myself. I don't want to say exercise because then people are like, I don't want to exercise, but a fun little, I had a couple beers one night and I was kind of bored and I'm like, I don't want to go play video games and I'm sitting looking at coin market cap for some reason. I've gone and closed a bunch of tabs and it came to coin market cap. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll start at the top. Let's work my way down the list and see what actually needs a blockchain. Could it be run on a database? Does it need to be decentralized? And if not, does it need to really exist? And the results surprised me really really surprised me so i don't want to spoil it for anybody but go there and try it sit down with like sit down with a beer one night i don't know it took me kind of like half an hour to go through the top like 50 of them i didn't know much about half of them but a quick google and i bring it up and i'm like mm, maybe not but but it's, it was a really interesting exercise and then you've obviously you've got the forks of the forks of the forks and it's a case of do you really need something that is four times faster than this other one over here? Like, is that enough of a, a value proposition to actually be worth using? Or do you need to be like 10 X kind of Elon Musk thinking or a hundred X or what's yeah. So 
That's if you've got a little bit of time in your hands and you've got a nice glass of wine or something, sit down, bring up coin market cap and have a little bit of fun and see, see where the night takes you. There you go. <laughs> well, we kind of talked about the current market situation. We talked about Digibyte. We talked about Bitcoin. You asked me what I thought about, is that the one to rule it all? And we've talked about Rapids a little bit as well. What else do you want to talk about? What do, it's been a while since you caught up, but I don't know. You know, there's always so many things going on in crypto. I don't even know what to talk about at this point. Yeah, we've, <laughs> unfortunately, I've kind of had some personal stuff going on. I haven't been able to do as many live streams and things. In fact, I've done all of like one in the last sort of four or five months, I think. But yeah, it's nice to kind of get back on here and start catching up with some people and things. And, and to do these kind of, it's one of the great things about this is bouncing ideas off of each other. So like I mentioned before, with those people in that, that, that were on stage sitting around singing Kumbaya about these seven different blockchains that previously were kind of at each other, I'm not cool with that. I think that's stupid. But I like bouncing ideas off of people. And I like the idea that between you and I having a good rational discussion, even if there are certain things that, that I say that you might not agree with and things like that, that we can still kind of like iron sharpening iron kind of thing and, and, and come out with some really cool stuff as a result of it. Yeah. And I, I think that's, um, I think that's really what's needed in this space more than anything. I think the salt on crypto Twitter gets to an all time high and nothing productive comes out of it. For even people who follow me on Twitter at Stu not 620, if you want to debate, that's fine. Point out your, 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 your opinion, point out some mm. facts and then we, I can come back with a counter argument or be like, Oh, you are right. Or I see your point. But uh, you know, one worders like you're an idiot. I mean, that doesn't solve anything. If I'm an idiot, explain why, no. and then we can yeah. kind of go back. I try not to block people as yeah. much as possible because, it, you know, I try to like to have that open source, you know, kind of like crypto's open source. Yeah. I like to be open source with my social accounts, but at least, yeah. like, let's have a high-level discussion or debate, and then we can yeah. either go our separate ways disagreeing, or maybe one of us learned a little something new and is like, man, I should probably take that into consideration. Maybe I need to start using this cryptocurrency. Maybe I need to buy some of this cryptocurrency or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's really difficult as well because I'll, you'll get things and they'll pop up and they'll be like, you're an idiot or Joe, you're an asshole. Well, I'm not going to argue with anybody that thinks I'm an asshole. <laughs> I probably agree with them there sometimes, but they're like, if, if I'd like to think that if I've got some kind of an opinion, there's probably a good reason for it. And I'm actually open to my opinion changing. So like you say, there is so much just general salt and toxicity and tribalism and it's not really healthy. I understand that people have invested in a particular product. They put their hard-earned wages, you know, they come home on a Friday and they're like, oh, I've had a hard week at work. I'm going to go invest in some cryptocurrency and this is what I think is the best. To then find out that, holy shit, BitConnect is actually a scam. That's a really good time for you to go, you know what? I thought it was good. Turns out it's not. I'm going to pull out of that. And I'm going to invest in something better. I'm going to do some more looking into things. I'm going to take, you know, maybe you're looking at the charts with Nick and Todd and Todd's basically going, this is looking pretty promising. Or maybe you want to be in something more long-term, in which case you look at Nick's fundamentals and things like that. But don't stay in BitConnect, for example, yeah. right? Like it's a shit coin, bail, change your mind, change your opinion, grow as a human being. You might learn something and it's amazing when you do and you'll be a better person for it. The world will be a better place as a result and you're not going to lose all your money basically. Or as Richard Hart would say, you're not going to get wrecked. <laughs> yeah. And really that's just investment psychology for individuals. It's, it's really easy for them to sell the winners, which are probably the ones that you should be holding for the long term because the space is going to continue to grow. And it's really yeah. hard for people to cut their losses on the losers. Sometimes yeah. a loser is just going to keep losing for a reason. Uh, so at some point, you, you got to get rid of the emotion, step back, look at the fundamentals. Like Josiah said, does this have a purpose? Is this going to succeed? Are the developers still active? Is the team transparent with treasury funds? Is there yeah. a governance structure? That's the coins that you need to be in the networks you need to be participating on. And going with BitConnect, I, I, on a lighter note, somebody sent me something over here. And they said, if, when you go to Christmas, people are going to ask you about cryptocurrencies. And you're probably going to have that asshole uncle who says, ha, Bitcoin, that thing is going to zero. He said, just yeah. show him a, a chart of BitConnect and say, well, technically you're wrong because BitConnect right now is still worth money. Even BitConnect, which is a proven Ponzi scheme, isn't down to zero. <laughs> so there <What>? you go. <laughs> I think it got removed from uh, CoinMarketCap recently, but still <sighs> has value. Can still be traded, can still be staked. So... If BitConnect can't go to zero, I don't think you're going to have to worry about Bitcoin going to zero. <laughs> we'll see, though. <laughs>
that's when they're like, Bitcoin's going to zero, and you're like, that's a scam. <laughs> No, an, no, 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 no. It should be an interesting uh, Christmas for some individuals. I, I already know I have family members that know I do. You know, I work for an institutional financial advisor, so I do all the traditional work with hedge funds and private equity and real assets. That's kind of my background on investments and, and market psychiatry. But they know I do stuff with crypto on YouTube after work. Like, why do you put all this effort for cryptocurrency? Isn't that a scam? Or isn't that, you know, the market's down? How's that going for you? And uh, instead of just being salty or not replying, try to educate them a little bit and be like, well, you know, give them a situation. You know, when the bank is closed on Sunday and you want to send, you owe the guy who just mowed your lawn some money and you can't send it to him. Well, now with Bitcoin, you can. It's 24-7. It, it's open for anybody and it's a global currency, meaning I can send it to somebody in Japan right now or vice versa. Or you're in New Zealand and it, you're a day ahead of me and you can still utilize Digibyte right, right now to send me if you want it. So I think if you start creating... Uh, these value propositions and start figuring out some uh, some finite like this is when Bitcoin is useful versus US dollar versus your bank account I think that kind of starts opening the eyes of potential new users um, yeah exactly because if you're if you're trying to like so I was talking with 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 my wife earlier I kind of do that sometimes I talk with my wife ah, it's a bad bad decision bad decision oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> so so we were having a chat and she basically was like oh look I've gone and I've got some clothes from a workmate of mine um can you send the money sure so i sent it to like we paid it jumped online sent the money sort of thing because long story short we got locked out of our bank accounts after we were trying to buy and sell a bit of bitcoin earlier on um that was fun and she's still locked out of them but anyway <laughs> the so, system <laughs> yay but so they locked us out of our bank accounts anyway so once we're back in there it's a case of right i'll we'll send we'll send the 30 bucks whatever but that 30 bucks isn't going to show up for another three days because we did it. It was after like 10 o'clock on a Friday night. So that's not going to show up in your bank account until Monday. Like that's over, like, yeah, it's ages away and they can't do anything about it. Like it's just kind of sitting up there in the middle of nowhere. Like, what are you going to do with it? It's, it sucks. And like, I can send you an instant message. We're having a live video chat around the world. I play D and D on a Monday night. We, we have some dude video call in from Toronto and Canada. And I'm down here in, in New Zealand. And it works flawlessly, but I still can't send money to somebody down the street and not take 48 hours. Like, yeah. freaking kidding well, and, and, and then probably a fee on top of that and et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah. That's where you get into the, into the problem. So did you also see recently that Coinbase just announced that now you are going to be able to have instant send of your USD from Coinbase to PayPal? So that's one, really? step in, one step in the right direction, meaning that's you know, I'm cool. going to take some profits or I need to spend some money. I can sell my Bitcoin for USD, instant send it to PayPal, and then can use it. You know, PayPal is integrated to tons of websites, probably thousands and hundreds of thousands of stores. So that's a step in the right direction. I think we really need to eventually have full interoperability with Bitcoin and PayPal, meaning if I'm on Coinbase, I can send instant send Bitcoin to PayPal and then use it. Now, that would be cool. Scale. So, but this is a stepping stone. Coinbase now integrated with PayPal with USD at least. I think next maybe there'll be USDC and maybe one day it will be BTC ultimately. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully. I want to quickly go back to what you were talking about, about um, sitting around like the, the Christmas table sort of thing, having dinner with your relatives. So this is something that somebody I saw on, on Twitter and I thought it was freaking hilarious, right? Because everyone's like, the, what's happening with the price? It's so volatile. Why would you do that? Why would you ever invest in it? So this, let me bring this up, is a picture that they kind of, that they put on there. So you can kind of see that going up and down and look at that price drop at the end there. That's Facebook. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. That's $123 billion light from Facebook. 20% gone. And, and how long was it? What, what was that? Like a few hours or something? Yeah. Gone. Oh just gone same uh, thing happens and it, 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 same thing happened in the tech bubble and even the the survivors like amazon apple google they went from ten dollars to two dollars that's an 80 percent correction and now amazon's worth sixteen hundred dollars so i yeah. mean things take building it's an immature market that means you have a lack of liquidity and uh news whether it's real or fake can can negatively impact or positively impact the market in a big way due to that lack of uh, lack of liquidity and the immaturity in the market. So it's the volatility you have to survive with if you believe that blockchain is going to be around for the future, which I do. And uh, really, we tell individuals to position your portfolio and the pro projects you believe in 
or projects you will actually start to use. Because this thing is going to switch from yeah. a speculative market to a utilization market. Again, if there's no utilization, then why does it exist? It probably shouldn't. So the price probably is going to follow that utilization in the end. Yeah. Well, the other cool thing as well is, um, so when my, my sister recently got married, I was wearing the Did You Buy it socks? And I see you've got a, a nice uh, I run nodes. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. I think it's a, what's your superpower? I run super nodes. So I think, I think that's one of the things that we need more of is it's cool little kind of like catchy sort of shirts like that. Like, you know, ask me about Bitcoin and stuff, you know, like that sort of, I think that kind of thing is going to be like, it sounds really cheesy, just, you know, a, a t-shirt, but I think having more of that kind of thing and being able to, you know, you're sitting down maybe at the local food court, someone sees your shirt and it says, ask me about Bitcoin or I run nodes on horizon, that kind of thing to be able to start up a conversation with a stranger. I like that. I think it's cool. And I think there's a growing amount of people who have interest in Bitcoin, but they hear what other people are saying, oh, scam, terrorist, drugs. And they're kind of scared to start diving deeper or ask the question. But like you said, if you have a shirt that says, ask me about Bitcoin or Bitcoin logo, maybe that will get them over that hump of fear or whatever it may be. Like, oh, can you tell me a little bit about it? And then you can kind of summarize it in a few sentences and say, hey, if you want more information, go to this website or check out coin market cap. And then all the websites of these cryptocurrencies are available and you can do a little research on your, your own, or maybe you can sit down, download the Coinbase app with them and be like, Hey, if you down, download this, I'll send you five dollars with the, with a Bitcoin, $10 worth of Bitcoin and kind of show them uh, for a very small amount of money. You know? I mean, I think that's one of the cooler things as well. So I did that with my cousin. He was, I was wearing a, a digibike shirt, similar to this one. And he was, he was basically like, Hey, isn't, hasn't hasn't it been you know there's problems and there's this and there's that and i've seen this on the news that that bitcoin's basically going to tank and i mean it kind of is a little bit but you know, he was like what's what's the broader appeal because he's like i see it on the news and things but he's like what's why would i want to get like why does it interest me and so similar to what we did before with the whole kind of talking about uh sending money and it taking ages i said just download the app we were sitting there, we're, we're actually at a bar, we're eating, apparently popcorn goes really well with, with beer. I didn't know that, but it does. And so we're sitting around this table and he basically, he downloads the app, it takes a couple seconds, he fires it up. And I said, okay, hold up your phone and now we'll scan the QR code and bloop, instantly the money's sent across. He's like, that's really cool. And he's like, but you sent me like five digibyte. That's like 10 cents, you cheap ass. And I'm like, whoa, I'm, I'm going to go giving you like $30,000 or something right now, right? Like, I'm just showing you like, look, we can do it in an instant and you know, have that money. You can turn around and respend it immediately. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think he was a little disappointed. I didn't send him like a hundred millions. It's like, you're the one that brought up that the market's down. I don't have the Digibyte to give you right now. They're not worth <laughs> enough. I didn't recruit my phones first. Exactly. Send me that back. Send me that back. I need it back. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should have been like, well, now we're going to demonstrate how low the transaction fees are. So you're going to send that back to me. <laughs> yeah oh, awesome anything else you want to talk about before we kind of wrap it up no that's that's actually that's really cool man hey look it's been so good to catch up with you again and so good to see you and and i love watching the videos um with you and todd and things and and keep on keep on being awesome man yeah i mean it, it's it's harder and you're still doing videos you said a little less but it's harder to run the bear market just because there's not as much to talk about not as much news not as exciting but we try to get on as much as we can to kind of point out the, uh, the negative things that have happened in the market. And then really the bullish side, I think people really underestimate the amount of money that can come into play from traditional finance. Since I work for an institutional uh, investment advisor, I kind of see that side of things. And I know that side of things. I know there's a lot of people out there that just kind of spew BS or they're copying other people's content or whatever it may be. I'm telling you for a fact that back exchange, mm -hmm. Eris X, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, Goldman Sachs, creating these trading desks and creating these platforms takes a lot of research and development, a lot of money, and a lot of time. They're not going to put that in if they don't believe that they can benefit from fees and from price appreciation of Bitcoin and the others that they're, they're striving to support moving forward. I think uh, a lot of this FUD came from them really trying to push down the price while they continued to build behind the scenes. And I think that that uh, pressure valve is going to kind of be released here in the first quarter, second quarter of 2019. I think you're going to start to see the sentiment and uh, hopefully the price and the market start to turn around as well. Nice. What a positive note to end it on. <laughs> there we go. So thank you guys for tuning in. Shout out to Josiah for coming here. 
Yes, this is a little more professional than normal. You see the t-shirts. Check out our other live shows or our interview. Me and Josiah had an interview back in the day, other hangouts, and one about Digibyte if you want to learn more about that project. And uh, stay tuned for your daily updates on cryptocurrencies right here at Learn Crypto.